One night, in long bygone times, man awoke and saw himself. He saw that he was naked under cosmos, homeless in his own body. All things dissolved before his testing thought. Wonder above wonder, horror above horror, unfolded in his mind. Then woman too awoke, and said it was time to go and slay. And he fetched his bow and arrow, a fruit of the marriage of spirit and hand, and went outside beneath the stars. But as the beasts arrived at the waterholes where he expected them of habit, he felt no more the tigers bound in his blood, but a great psalm about the brotherhood of suffering between everything alive. That day he did not return with prey, and when they found him by the next new moon, he was sitting dead by the waterhole. Whatever happened? A breach in the very unity of life, a biological paradox, an abomination, an absurdity, an exaggeration of disastrous nature. Life had overshot its target, blowing itself apart. So there he stands with his visions, betrayed by the universe, in wonder and fear. The beast knew fear as well, in thunderstorms and on the lion's claw. But man became fearful of life itself, indeed of his very being. Life that was for the beast to feel the play of power. It was heat and games and strife and hunger. And then at last to bow before the law of course. In the beast, suffering is self-confined. In man, it knocks holes into a fear of the world and a despair of life. Even as the child sets out on the river of life, the roars from the waterfall of death rise highly above the veil, ever closer and tearing, tearing at its joy. Man beholds the earth and it is breathing like a great lung. Whenever it exhales, delightful life swarms from all its pores and reaches out toward the sun. But when it inhales, a moan of rupture passes through the multitude and corpses whip the ground like bouts of hail. Not merely his own day could he see, the graveyards wrung themselves before his gaze, the laments of sunken millennia wailed against him from the ghastly decaying shapes. The earth turned dreams of mothers. Future's curtain unraveled itself to reveal a nightmare of endless repetition, a senseless squander of organic material. The suffering of human billions makes its entrance into him through the gateway of compassion. From all that happened arises a laughter to mock the demand for justice, his profoundest ordering principle. He sees himself emerge in his mother's womb. He holds up his hand in the air, and it has five branches. Whence this devilish number five? And what has it to do with my soul? He is no longer obvious to himself. He touches his body in utter horror. This is you, and so far do you extend and know, Father. He carries a meal within him. Yesterday it was a beast that could itself dash around. Now I suck it up and make it part of me, and where do I begin and end? All things chain together in causes and effects, and everything he wants to grasp dissolves before the testing thought. Soon he sees mechanics even in the so far whole and dear in the smile of his beloved. There are other smiles as well, a torn boot with toes. Eventually, the features of things are features only of himself. Nothing exists without himself. Every line points back at him. The world is but a ghostly echo of his voice. He leaps up loudly screaming and wants to disgorge himself onto the earth along with his impure me. He feels the looming of madness and wants to find death before losing even such ability. 
but as he stands before imminent death, he grasps its nature also, and the cosmic import of the step to come. His creative imagination constructs new, fearful prospects behind the curtain of death, and he sees that even there is no sanctuary found. And now he can discern the outline of his biological cosmic terms. He is the universe's helpless captive, kept to fall into nameless possibilities. From this moment on, he is in a state of relentless panic. Such a feeling of cosmic panic is pivotal to every human mind. Indeed, the race appears destined to perish insofar as any effective preservation and continuation of life is ruled out when all of the individual's attention and energy goes to endure or relay the catastrophic high tension within. The tragedy of a species becoming unfit for life by over-revolving one ability is not confined to humankind. Thus, it is thought, for instance, that certain deer in paleontological times succumbed as they acquired overly heavy horns. In depressive states, the mind may be seen in the image of such an antler, in all its fantastic splendor, pinning its bearer to the ground. The identity of purpose and perishment is, for giant deer and man alike, the tragic paradox of life. The human being saves itself and carries on. It performs, to extend a settled phrase, a more or less self-conscious repression of its damaging surplus of consciousness. This process is virtually constant during our waking and active hours and is a requirement of social adaptability and of everything commonly referred to as healthy and normal living. The whole of living that we see before our eyes today is from inmost to outmost enmeshed in repressional mechanisms, social and individual. They can be traced right into the tritest formulas of everyday life, though they take a vast and multifarious variety of forms. It seems legitimate to at least identify four major kinds, naturally occurring in every possible combination. Isolation, anchoring, distraction, and sublimation. In everyday interaction, isolation is manifested in a general code of mutual silence, primarily toward children so these are not at once scared senseless by the life they have just begun, but retain their illusions until they can afford to lose them. In return, children are not to bother the adults with untimely reminders of sex, toilet or death. Among adults, there are the rules of tact, the mechanism being openly displayed when a man who weeps on the street is removed with police assistance. The mechanism of anchoring also serves from early childhood. Parents, home, the street become matters of course to the child and give it a sense of assurance. This fear of experience is the first and perhaps the happiest protection against the cosmos that we ever get to know in life. A fact that doubtless also explains the much debated infantile bonding the question of whether that is sexually tainted too is unimportant here. When the child later discovers that those fixed points are as arbitrary and ephemeral as any others, it has a crisis of confusion and anxiety and promptly looks around for another anchoring. Any culture is a great rounded system of anchorings built on foundational firmaments the basic cultural ideas. The average person makes do with the collective firmaments the personality is building for himself. The person of character has finished his construction, more or less grounded on the inherited collective main firmaments. God, the church, the state, morality, fate, the law of life, the people, the future. The closer to main firmaments a certain carrying element is, the more perilous 
it is to touch. Here, a direct protection is normally established by means of penal codes and threats of prosecution. Inquisition, censorship, the conservative approach to life. We love the anchorings for saving us, but also hate them for limiting our sense of freedom. A very popular mode of protection is distraction. One limits attention to the critical bounds by constantly enthralling it with impressions. This is typical even in childhood. Without distraction, the child is also insufferable to itself. Mom, what am I to do? Distraction is, for example, the high society's tactic for living. It can be likened to a flying machine made of heavy material but embodying a principle that keeps it airborne whenever applying. It must always be in motion as air only carries it fleetingly. The pilot may grow drowsy and comfortable out of habit, but the crisis is acute as soon as the engine flux. The tactic is often fully conscious. Despair can dwell right underneath and break through in gushes, in a sudden sobbing. When all distractive options are expended, spleen sets in, ranging from mild indifference to fatal depression. Only a limited part of humanity can make do with mere changes, whether in work, social life or entertainment. A cultured person demands connections, lines, a progression in the changes. Nothing finite satisfies at length one is ever proceeding, gathering knowledge, making a career. The phenomenon is known as yearning or transcendental tendency. Whenever a goal is reached, the yearning moves on. Hence, its object is not the goal, but the very attainment of it, the gradient, not the absolute height, of the curve representing one's life. Any grounds of progressive optimism are removed by this major psychological law. The fourth remedy against panic, sublimation, is a matter of transformation rather than repression. Through stylistic or artistic gifts can the very pain of living at times be converted into valuable experiences. Positive impulses engage the evil and put it to their own ends. Fastening onto its pictorial, dramatic, heroic, lyric or even comic aspects. Unless the worst sting of suffering is blunted by other means or denied control of the mind, such utilization is unlikely, however. Image. The mountaineer does not enjoy his view of the abyss while choking with vertigo. Only when this feeling is more or less overcome does he enjoy it, anchored. To write a tragedy one must to some extent free oneself from, betray the very feeling of tragedy and regard it from an outer, that is, aesthetic point of view. The current phase of life's chronic fever is particularly tainted by this circumstance. The absence of naturally, biologically based spiritual activity shows up, for example, in the pervasive recourse to distraction, entertainment, sport, radio, the rhythm of the times. Terms for anchoring are not as favorable. All the inherited collective systems of anchorings are punctured by criticism and anxiety, disgust, confusion, despair, leak in through the rifts. If we continue these considerations to the bitter end, then the conclusion is not in doubt. As long as humankind recklessly proceeds in the fateful delusion of being biologically fated for triumph, nothing essential will change. As its numbers mount and the spiritual atmosphere thickens, the techniques of protection must assume an increasingly brutal character. And humans will persist in dreaming of salvation and affirmation and a new messiah.
Yet when many saviors have been nailed to trees and stoned on the city squares, then the last Messiah shall come. Then will appear the man who, as the first of all, has dared strip his soul naked and submit it alive to the outmost thought of the lineage, the very idea of doom. A man who has fathomed life and its cosmic ground and whose pain is the earth's collective pain. With what furious screams shall not mobs of all nations cry out for his thousandfold death? When like a cloth his voice encloses the globe, and the strange message has resounded for the first and last time. The life of the worlds is a roaring river, but earth's is a pond and a backwater. The sign of doom is written on your brows. How long will you kick against the pinpricks? But there is one conquest and one crown, one redemption and one solution. Know yourselves, be infertile, and let the earth be silence after ye. And when he has spoken, they will pour themselves over him, led by the pacifier makers and the midwives, and bury him in their fingernails. He is the last messiah. As son from father, he stems from the archer by the waterhole.